Imagine if you could easily find solutions to make your region or city smarter, greener, better connected, more social, and closer to citizens. The InterAg Europe Policy Learning Platform can help you. Access knowledge about the latest policy trends. Discover expert validated good practices from all over Europe. Find solutions in our peer review. Get tailored support from our expert team. We can connect you with the right people and organizations. Together, we will find ways to solve your region's or city's challenges. Start your policy learning journey today. Yeah, welcome uh, to this webinar supporting the rural green transition. Welcome everybody, ladies and gentlemen. This is the first webinar organized by the Interreg Europe Policy Learning Platform after the summer break. We hope that you have had a good rest and that you're eager to jump into the next round of uh, interregional learning with us. My name is Katharina Krell. I'm a somatic expert for the Interreg Europe Policy Learning Platform. I'd like to introduce my team. Simon Hamkin, thematic expert like myself, and Lotte von Meil, our web app expert. Simon and I will moderate the event today and Lotte will take care of technical issues. A few words of housekeeping. As usual, the audience is muted. We invite you to uh, interact with us by using the chat. You can use it to post any question you have for us or for the speakers, and we will read your question to the speakers after their presentations. We can also use the chat to share links and uh, comments. So take a look at it. Now today's topic of uh, rural green transition was met with a lot of interest. You have been over 200 people, 214 exactly to sign up. So welcome to all of you. Um, we have a poll for you to get an idea why you're interested in decarbonization policies for rural areas. Um, let's see if we can launch the poll. Just click on as many answers as you like. It's a multiple choice. Yeah, the topic of rural green transition um, was, I mean, it was on our agenda for a long time. We have programmed this event specifically because you have requested it in all our recent uh, community surveys. And uh, it's true that we haven't done much work on, uh, on uh, rural areas. So um, let's see. Uh, this is to do a little bit of justice uh, to the other parts of Europe. So why are you interested in decarbonization? I work on policies for rural areas is the dominant answer with 54%, followed by I work in a public body in a rural area, 36%, and 32 I live in a rural area and 25 because it's a personal interest. All right, so that gives us a good idea. Thank you very much. And uh, I hand over to my colleague uh, for a thematic introduction. Yep, uh, thank you very much, Katarina, and good afternoon to everybody also from, uh, from my side. Uh, so why are we examining the rural transition today in this uh, webinar? Well, it's not only that it's one of the popular topics from the community, it's also because when we think of low carbon transition, we tend to think of urban areas, of urban mobility strategies, of district renovations, and, and so on. Uh, and this focus is not surprising when 75% of Europe's population lives in, in urban areas. Uh, but rural areas make a unique and important contribution to our way of life and to our economic development. And they need tailored approaches that take account both of their challenges and their strengths. Uh, whilst also respecting ecological uh, boundaries. Uh, these challenges include sparse and aging populations, uh, sometimes remote locations, and less access to infrastructure and, uh, and services. Uh, so more needs to be done to make rural areas more attractive, else people move to urban centers uh, for economic and, and social opportunities. Uh, but rural areas also have strengths uh, such as significant access to natural resources, uh, a frequently strong sense of community and self-sufficiency, uh, which can enable collaborative approaches. Uh, so in fact, the green transition can bring many benefits to rural areas, 
uh, with new service provision and socioeconomic and environmentally beneficial practices. Uh, so today we will look at the rural green transition, focusing on three aspects of uh, low carbon energy, uh, sustainable transport modes, and agriculture, looking at how the transition uh, can also boost economic growth, protect the environment, and strengthen communities. Uh, so Inter Europe projects have been examining rural transition, and you'll see here a selection of those projects. Uh, so we have those that are focusing on renewable energies, so bioenergy in particular, but also other decentralized energy production, uh, smart grids, and self-consumption. Uh, these are including your bio for eco and resil. Uh, we have mobility projects examining demand responsive and last mile uh, solutions such as last mile and Desti smart. And then we have those projects which are at the interface of low carbon with agriculture and, and nature management such as uh, agro res and arenas, which we'll hear from shortly in our, our keynote. Uh, so I would encourage you to look into these projects and their achievements and their identified good practices. Uh, but if you want to have an already curated set of uh, information, uh, you can look into some of our other activities, um, including our past policy briefs on community energy, bioenergy and demand responsive uh, transport, uh, as well as a selection of our webinar recordings. Uh, so links for all of these will be included in the post event um, email that you'll get. So don't go and find them now. Uh, you'll get links to all of these coming straight into your inbox in the next few days. Uh, so for now, I'll pass back to Katarina to introduce today's agenda. Thank you. Yes, we have a, a set of uh, um, speakers invited uh, to cover these topics from different aspects. Of course, um, we cannot uh, pretend to cover all the rural green transition However, with the topics that we have uh, picked, mobility, agriculture, and uh, renewable energy, we hope uh, to give a good glimpse of uh, what the, the green transition in the rural areas can mean. And uh, we will kick off uh, with a keynote from uh, Linda Zardo from Università IUAV di Venezia. She is a partner in the IRENES project, and uh, she will um, elaborate on the role of rural areas in the low carbon transition. Hi, Linda. Hi, Katarina. Hi, everybody. We are then having uh, uh, three good practices, um, starting off uh, with uh, Manolis Karampinis from CERT in Greece with the BCO project. This is focusing on uh, bioenergy communities. Hi, Manolis. And uh, then we're staying with a speaker from uh, uh, the same area, Professor Alexandros uh, Papahatsis from the University of Thessaly who is going to explain us uh, about uh, greening approaches for the agricultural sector on the example of uh, greenhouses. And uh, we will end uh, with a topic of mobility, where Manfred Meyer from the region's management, uh, Ost Tirol, East Tirol in Austria, partner in the Last Mile project, will explain us uh, about uh, mobility approaches for small town mobility. So uh, uh, thank you for joining us. We are having a question and discussion uh, session afterwards. Uh, and uh, so with no further ado, I would like to hand over to Linda for the keynote. The floor is yours. Thanks, Katarina. I'm about to share screen with the presentation. I hope everybody can see. Yes, we can see. Okay, thanks. Well, first of all, uh, thanks. Um, good afternoon, and thanks for this chance to join this webinar. Uh, I'm Linda Zardo from the UAB University in Venice. Uh, I'm environmental expert of our urban planning and spatial planning team. Um, I would like today to spend a couple of words about the role of rural areas in the green transition. Um, but uh, before we are focusing on green transitioning rural areas, I would like to spend just a couple of words about what we mean when we talk about rural. Uh, we tend to think about rural as something, something like the country to urban, but then what is urban, right? We have different institutions, we have different agencies defining it and with different criteria, by the way. Um, so for example, 
if we if we take the World Bank uh, uh, definition or J JRC definition, we can say that urban is something. Uh, I mean, we have cities that are urban settlements, usually above the fifty thousand inhabitants. We have towns that are between the five thousand and fifty thousand, and then below towns, we start talking about rural. Um, even though it's a flexible definition, but at least let's let's put a let's say a boundary around what we're talking about today. Um, we know, we heard, we read that the world is getting urban, so the majority of the world population live in cities. But then, so why talking about rural today? The point is that we have a huge amount of territory that is rural. So even though we don't have the majority of the population, we have a lot of land. Um, and this land represents specific features, right? So when we want to address uh, what we call green transition, we need to take into consideration these specific features representing specific challenges and potential solutions. Um, in particular, uh, we can try to summarize a little bit these features regarding specifically uh, the green transition, uh, regarding the fact that rural regions contain natural resources. So the, a big amount of goods and services being consumed and used in the cities are coming, are being produced in rural areas. Um, so there is also a strong link when we talk about rural urban uh, exchange in terms of services, of goods and people and so on. Um, so they are also very important in terms of the relationship with what is not rural, of course. Uh, in rural areas, we found um, many emission intensive activities. So there is need to target specifically maybe those kind of sectors and, and segments of the economy. But also they are being, they're not only impacting on this sense, but also being impacted a lot from climate change because they are being quite uh, hit by uh, extreme events derived from climate change. And also they present some aspects of vulnerability due to uh, level of uh, different levels of uh, adaptive capacity, capacity of the local staff and institution to face specific type of challenges and to to um, build forecasts and then design possible measures to address these impacts. Um, on top of the features, we can also talk about specific challenging sectors, let's say, um, in the sense that, for example, as Katarina uh, mentioned at the beginning of our webinar today, um, transportation is a complex issue. Because of course we have a uh, because of the sprawl we have a dispersed uh, population. So if we need to put in contact and ensure this linkage of people and of goods as well, we need to think about how we can decarbonize such mobility. Um, another quite challenging uh, topic regards land use and ecosystem services because as we said, having a lot of territory, so of land available, let's say in rural areas, we also providing there, producing there a large amount of the goods and services we consume. So we need to understand this cause effect linkage between how we manage land use and what we are producing or harming in terms of ecosystem services. Uh, renewable energies are another topic, of course, and then circular and bioeconomy can be a promising, um, let's say, path of, for experimentation. Um, trying to wrap up what we, I mean, a bit of the, the, the issues that we are somehow, that are popping up when we open this box of rural areas and green transition, there's also a matter of the population and equity. Because of course, because of some, um, some gaps in terms of services, in terms of access to specific, even job opportunities or um, chances in general, we can call it with different names based on where we are, which country we are in Europe, but many countries are facing the population of rural areas. And this population is often due to a lack of equity in access to either basic services or in general um, access to human well-being. So people choose to live and go to, to, to live and try to live in cities to, um, sorry, uh, enhance their quality of life. 
but even though it looks challenging, solution exists. And today we're going to have this kind of quick round of attempts of building solution together with territories. Um, from our point of view today, we would like to, we as UAP team that I'm representing, we would like just to uh, put the light, the spotlight, let's say, on issues of governance, governance policy designs, and spatial distribution um, when talking about uh, renewable energy production. Um, we would like just to have a zoom on this aspect, knowing that the colleagues then are going to uh, present some zooms on other topics, just to show a, a specific case of challenge and possible solution that we are trying to build with our, together with our partners and managing authorities. Uh, when talking about energy production and specifically renewable energy production, um, we are talking about some barriers um, in our territories that we investigated and identified together with our stakeholders. Um, from one side, we have institutional capacity that can be lacking at uh, local or municipal level, let's say. Uh, there are poor, sometimes we still face poor policy design and incentives in the sense that while European national frameworks exist, there, is still some, there are still some difficulties in trying to just ground them uh, in the real practice. Uh, there is still some lacking of uh, awareness in, in terms of citizens and also, um, I mean, lacking awareness and ownership, which is quite related. And of course, potential negative effects uh, from the environment and the social um, sector. So negative impacts on the environment and social sector when producing renewable energies. So um, the Agenda's Interact project tried to make one step forward, uh, trying to address some of these challenges um, to, to facilitate a bit the, the upscale of the production of renewable energies in five regions in Europe. Um, and to better understand this, we would like just to say that renewable energies are provided by nature in the sense that they are represent a subset of ecosystem services. But of course, when we are producing through land, one ecosystem service, let's say, or a subset, we might um, trigger some trade-offs with others. Just to give you some practical example, if we want to maximize agricultural biomass production, we might have some side effects in food production. Or if we want to invest in solar farms, we might have some negative effects in terms of aesthetic value of landscapes, identity, and so on. Same for hydropower production and maybe the habitat of rivers and wetlands. So what we did in these five uh, countries with our pilots and dialogue with the municipal authorities was trying to analyze, identify, analyze and map which can, which can be these key trade-offs between the production of renewable energies and the impact on environmental and social systems to support uh, decision-making. So what we did, just to give you um, a snapshot of one example of the work of these three years, is that for one of the regions, we met policy, existing policy constraints regarding renewables. So where it is allowed to, um, uh, to build solar farms, where it is allowed to produce agricultural biomass and so on. And then we mapped ecosystem service provisioning. So we analyzed the potential production of renewables and compare it with potential side effects in terms of environment or social and economic activities. So food production, tourism, and so on. And we map the mismatches because where there is a mismatch, so the law saying, yes, you can, but the environmental analysis saying you can't, or the other way around, it means that we need further attention by our policymaker to fine tune the existing policies, making them, because maybe they are underestimating a problem or overestimating a potential impact. Um, trying to wrap up, so from the particular case, trying to go back to the general picture of what we are talking uh, today. Um, of course, green transition in rural areas are facing specific challenges and need a dedicated approach. We cannot think that we can apply 
the same measures to cities and to rural areas. Um, a collaborative and place-based approach is necessary because if we are not collaborating with our municipal authorities, we cannot really um, understand their needs. And we, the risk is that we might propose the wrong measures that are not fitting their purpose. Um, an integrated policy approach would be great at the local level. So we use the ecosystem service approach to together, for example, environment, society, and economics, which is a quite, it, it looked to be quite useful and promising because recognized also by the, our stakeholders. Um, and try to look for win-win solution, or at least not measures that are affecting negatively cities and trying to, um, provide some benefits to rural areas or the other way around. Uh, so trying to avoid any kind of conflict in this sense of policies. And sustainable development need to be at the core of all policies that we're going to, to, to design and to think about. Capacity building, participation and monitoring, of course, can be very useful to try to go towards this such sustainable development. Key policy areas of interest can be mobility, land use, and ecosystem services. I presented at the beginning, renewable energy, and circular and bioeconomy. I am very curious now to see the contribution from the colleagues to this specific, let's say, puzzle of pieces. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Linda, for uh, uh, framing a little bit uh, the discussion. I think uh, um, what you mentioned, the lack of institutional capacity is really a serious barrier. I mean, small town administrations are simply not as well stuffed as those in the large cities. And your concluding slide here uh, calls for collaborative uh, place-based uh, approaches. Um, in the area of energy, the covenant of mayors has come up with a good solution for this. Um, there are many multi-municipal uh, groupings comprising many small communities. Uh, that plan jointly their energy and climate strategy. And they can pool the resources uh, as in Cyprus, or they, large, uh, they rely on a larger administration in the center surrounded by smaller communities uh, as in East Belgium. And I think in Italy you also have quite a few examples of these. Um, did you assess this uh, in our rings? These, these multi-municipality um, SECAPs and SEAPs? Uh, I mean, actually, we analyzed them before Irene, so that was part of our background, and we took, we, we addressed them through another project, another piece of research, let's say, and then incorporated those results into the building the background for Irene. So what emerged was that um, while there were already a lot of measures put in place for for. Um, for mitigation, of course, of climate change, so reducing uh, emissions, and also to produce some clean energy. Uh, what emerged was that there was this clear lack of, of awareness regarding the conflicts of this. Not only, I mean, they know, they, I mean, our regional authorities, they know that they exist, but they had no clue about the magnitude. So it was really about quantifying. And we're talking about lack of capacity was that we provided them technical support in quantifying in order to set up priorities saying, okay, this is a very important trade-off and it is located there and so on. And this gave them the floor to start rethinking and redesign, fine-tuning the policies. Yeah, and that shows the importance of the link uh, uh, to data and uh, to uh, academia. Yeah. We will come to that uh, um, uh, in our roundtable discussion again. Um, just a short last question to you. Do you, you talk about the depopulation, but um, during the COVID pandemic, the people have somehow rediscovered uh, the advantages uh, of the, the green areas without many people. And at the same time, the pandemic has taught us how to make better use of digital solutions for teleworking. Do you think that these two trends could uh, contribute to a reversal of the trend to urbanization, that people move again to the countryside in a sort of repopulation? Well, thanks for this question, which is actually quite fascinating, I would say. Um, there are these um, conflicting trends, right? Because on one hand, it's true that the COVID gave this kind of push to rediscover the rural areas, but on one hand, the question is who is rediscovering the rural areas? It is very linked to income. 
uh, and chance of having an opportunity. Uh, so it's really about democracy and, and equity in this sense. And everybody should have the chance to uh, decide whether they want to pursue their well-being here and there and what we can, we can put our effort in making them equally attractive based on preferences, I would say. But I see huge problems in terms of services, for example, um, decentralization, centralization, post services, all these very difficult, very complex issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for this appreciation and thanks for your keynote, Linda. Um, I invite now uh, our next uh, speaker to the floor, Manolis Carampinis. Uh, please turn on your camera and share your slides. The floor is yours. Thank you, Katarina, for the introduction and the invitation to present in this event. I'm just now sharing a screen, I hope. You can see it now? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. So my name is Manuel Serabinis. I'm a research associate at Center for Research and Technology, a LASA research organization based in Greece. And today I will speak about an example of a real transition using the model of the bioenergy communities. And I will focus on a very specific example, the energy community of Karditsa in Greece. Uh, I won't go into the contents of the presentation here because I think the time is the major challenge today, uh, but I would like to frame a bit the discussion and explain where this initiative takes place. So Karditsa is a, a regional unit in Greece, essentially a NATS 3 administrative area uh, located in Thessaly. For Greeks, Thessaly is uh, almost, I would say, synonymous with agriculture. Thessaly is the location of the Thessaly plain where a large part of the Greek cereal production takes place as well as cotton culture. Cultivation. So the region over here, I hope you can see my pointer. Uh, if we look into the geophysics, let's say, of, uh, the, of the region of Thessaly, well, first of all, you can see some, let's say, urban agglomerations. Karditsa, for example, is a city of around 38,000 uh, inhabitants. The whole region has an area of around 100,000 inhabitants, nearly 1% of the Greek population. But you can see also that there's a quite clear dividing line between the eastern part, which is the agricultural part, and the western part, which is the mountainous part. So on the east, we have the plain of Karditsa, part of the Thessaly plain, where you have agricultural activities. Somewhere in the middle, we have Lake Plastira. It's an artificial lake created some decades ago, now a very popular tourist destination, but initially the purpose was for uh, irrigation. And on the west, as I said, we have the Agrafa Mountains, uh, with a very picturesque destination as well. Uh, when it comes now to biomass enthusiasts such as myself, uh, it's very clear that from this uh, area you can sort all types of things. What we call agrobiomass residues in the eastern part, but also in the western part we have forest residues as well as a small but I think quite vibrant wood processing industry from which you can sort also relevant woody based assortments such as sawdust. So uh, the story behind the energy community of Karditsa, and this, I will stay here a little longer. In 2012, ESSEC, uh, for short uh, in Greek, it was established as a civic cooperative with around 400 members. The members were mostly local citizens, but also institutions from the area, like the municipalities of, the, of Karditsa. And essentially, you could say it was a kind of a spin-off, an initiative that was promoted by ANCA, which was the original development agency of Karditsa. The idea behind the SEC was to mobilize and use the abandoned local biomass resources, the forestry ones and the agricultural ones, and to construct and operate a biomass power plant with an indicative range of one megawatt electrical. Why a power plant? Because in Greece, like many other countries at the time, we had a Fini tariff scheme, so it made sense to produce renewable electricity and sell it to the grid. The issue with this uh, idea and the vicious circle ESSEC found itself in the very beginning was that it costs quite a lot of money for a small um, initiative such as an energy community to build a biomass power plant. We're talking about an investment of a few 
uh, million euros. And you, of course, you can mobilize external funding for that. But the typical issue you run into is that you don't have, at the beginning, biomass supply contract from the producers for biomass, the farmers or the foresters. And if you don't have a supply contract, you don't have a bankability of the project. And that go. And if you don't have bankability, if nothing goes on, then you don't have uh, motivation to put people behind the supply contract. And that's how it goes. So what? ESSEC did to break the vicious circle, and I think the key difference between other, let's say, bioenergy communities which were, let's say, thought about in Greece or elsewhere was that they decided to go ahead with some real activities. So they managed to procure some capital from the members, they managed to get uh, funding through a leader program, and through that they started building and operating a biomass pellet plan, essentially saying, selling pellet fuels to uh, the market to individual consumers. The pellet plant started producing in October 2017. It's using sodas from local mills. You can see the product on the bag somewhere in the slide. And what happened also uh, in the last few years, in 2018, uh, there was a law by the Greek state government about energy communities. So ESSEC was transformed into an energy community according to the law. Uh, there is an ongoing process about building a photovoltaic plant for the members in order to have net metering and other measures for reducing the electricity bills, for example. And of course, there have always been continuous discussions about biomass suppliers, uh, the farmers, cooperatives, municipalities, and so on. And a key point, let's say, I think in the evolution of uh, ESSEC is that in 2020, November 2020, we started together with ESSEC a new Horizon 2020 project, BCOOP, which has as its goal to promote the concept of bioenergy communities in Europe. Uh, I cannot go into details about the project here, I'm afraid, but um, one, let's say, important thing is that uh, the project is directly supporting four energy communities in Europe, in Spain, Italy, Poland, and in Greece, it is ESSEC. Uh, and based on these, the results of the project, we are aiming also to replicate these examples in other uh, bioenergy communities around Europe. So going to a bit more details in how BCOOP is supporting, let's say, ESSEC, when the project started, this was, let's say, the fairly simple business model that ESSEC is following. It operates a pellet plant, it procures some woody biomass residues, mostly from the wood processing industry, and it upgrades them into pellets for the market, essentially mostly individual consumers, households, I would say. Uh, our idea within the project, something that we sat together with ESSEC and co-developed, together with other local and regional stakeholders, was to expand their activities. On the one hand, we have the new feedstocks that the SEP could mobilize. Uh, and on the other side, we have the new products of the SEC. And in that case, we are talking both about new types of fuels, perhaps a kind of mixed pellets or chips, wood chips, if the customer can afford it. But what is also very relevant, we are talking about now evolution of a SEC into an energy service company that can directly sell heat to consumers. Uh, here are some slides, let's say, about how this activity is taking place. When it comes to the biomass sourcing, at the moment, we are concentrating on three different assortments. Urban prunings uh, from the, let's say, the city of Karditsa primarily. At the moment, they go into a landfill and occasionally they may be incinerated without any kind of energy recovery, while ESSEC has the capacity to upgrade them into a fuel that can be used for boilers. Another assortment we are looking for, I realize this may not be fully rural, but uh, it is a quite, I would say, sexy thing for many uh, uh, citizens, is the spent coffee grounds for cafeteria. And this is the, the reason is not the volume of the biomass you can mobilize. It's not irrelevant, but not the main reason. It's the fact that almost everybody enjoys drinking coffee, so they are quite used to this, um, let's say, biomass residue. And when someone is doing activities to uh, valorize it, they show immediate interest. It's a very good tool for citizen involvement, I would say. So there we are working with the cafeterias, we are uh, an, an NGO that is working on the coffee uh, recycling, and we can also upgrade them into pellets, into a sex facility. And the final one at the, the Limli Plasteria municipality near the artificial lake I mentioned before, we are mostly looking into the forest residues that can be uh, collected from the site. 
on the other side, as I said, we have the final products, mixed pellets that a sec can produce. We already have produced, for example, different mixes of coffee, spent coffee grounds with woody biomass assortments, chips, if the end user can handle a biomass with a larger volume and a smaller energy density. But uh, what is now we, the, the thing we're looking also is that the SEC could install and operate biomass boilers for specific uh, heat consumers. At the moment, a SEC is in discussion with uh, the municipality and they will, uh, the Cardiff municipality, and they will install some biomass boilers at uh, schools. Uh, this will be the first thing. One minute. Have. Yes, okay. Uh, here is just a slide about the geographical scope of sex activities. The plan, pellet plant is here, a little to the south of the city of Karditsa. And here is the Plasteria Lake from which there are forests nearby and the, there can be biomass procurement. My point here is that essentially the transport distance is very, very short in all cases, so it is economically. And also here, for example, in the Limit Plasteria Lake, we have a conglomeration of hotels. Uh, the region is not very cold for European standards, but we are thinking they might be relevant biomass and users because they have hot water demand and so on. Um, yeah, we have developed, let's say, on the project, a roadmap for a sec until 2030. The idea is to do, let's say, gradual um, increments of activity and try to reach the goal that initially had by 2030 by building up their expertise in biomass. Uh, for the uh, attendance of the event, uh, I have to say a few things, very short things about the Big Group project, is that within the, if you go to the project website, you can find several tools that we have developed and that you can use to help you um, think about uh, to help you establish your own community by uh, bioenergy projects. We have a self-assessment tool to assess your knowledge on the subject. We have an e-market environment that allows to connect equipment or fuel providers with the potential demand. We have a knowledge exchange platform which you can uh, register on and ask questions or find other projects and so on and we have a toolkit which is essentially an online repository of existing tools developed by other projects or institutions a uh, few final remarks why are we talking about biology for well, green transition is quite relevant because tomorrow we have a very topical uh, vote on the european parliament about uh, red three under which, let's say, there are some amendments which are not very favorable to bioenergy in general. And many people have been asking about that. So uh, why are we supporting this? First, because we have in the rural areas, the local resources, the agricultural, the forest residues, even energy crops in marginal, abandoned or contaminated land. And you can use them to cover the local energy needs. Uh, the socioeconomic aspects are always very important, the local job creation, the supply chains, plant operation, and if we are talking about also the part of the technology itself, it's European based, not necessarily local, but definitely from Europe. Uh, we have, when we were talking about heat production pathways, cost effectiveness compared to fossil fuels. This used to be the case before, but even more so after the energy crisis. And finally, yeah. Time out, yeah. Uh, should I stop here or not? Yeah, finish your sentence, come on. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you, Adriana. Uh, what we're always saying is that uh, in rural areas, farmers, for example, have a residue management problem. They have to sort out residues, they have to find ways to treat them uh, alternatively. And what they are doing now mostly is field burning in many parts of Europe, while bioenergy provides a solution that is more, less, much less polluting and also saves fossil energies. I will leave it at that. There's one more slide, but I will leave it out as uh, for the discussion. Thank you and sorry for taking too much of the time. Thank you, Manolis. All the points that you've uh, made uh, while you were over time were very important. And I also don't understand the adversity in the in the re red uh, amendments against uh, bioenergy. I think it's some campaign that uh, doesn't come from here. So um, I, I agree with the local value, with the local sources, and your cooperative uh, example showed how starting from the locally available resources, a first initial economic activity was developed, maybe just a pellet production and not an energy production, but then this created first income for the cooperative and funding for more activities. I think it's an excellent example. Thank you for being with us and thank you for sharing. I have a question uh, from the audience, from uh, Ruth Borrego, from the regional government of Andalusia, who would like to know 
which are the steps to create an energy community in rural areas? Yeah, uh, well, uh, the answer would definitely vary depending on your country, I would say. Uh, as I understand, the energy community at the moment has a kind of EU level definition. Uh, but I um, don't think there is a, um, let's say, a very specific European directive and different member states have established their own national laws to uh, promote and uh, establish uh, energy communities. Um, in Greece, this happened, for example, in 2018, we were one of the first countries to do so. And now uh, the, our legislation was not entirely harmonized with the European definition, but I think there will be some adjustments in the future. Uh, what I can, uh, I cannot give any specific advice about the Spanish case, for example. What I can suggest is that people who are interested in establishing energy communities can go into relevant websites, such as the website of Rescoop, the European Federation of the Renewables and the Cooperatives. And from there, it's a good starting point to find uh, what are the steps in your specific country. I also found out today, actually, that there is a new initiative, I think, from the European Commission about supporting the establishment and providing technical support for uh, energy communities in rural areas in particular. So I think this project started in June or July this year. So I guess people can now uh, take advantage of that and ask, let's say, for more concrete support. We will share the link uh, to this uh, yeah, uh, technical it. support action, or, or you can share it. I can I've share seen it, it yes. as well. This yeah. is very yeah. relevant. Yeah. Thank you very much. OK, well, um, it would be nice to continue discussion. But uh, for the benefit of our other speakers, I would like to hand over to uh, our next speaker, Professor Alexand Alexandros Papachatsis. Uh, Alex, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you for the invitation. Good afternoon to everybody from uh, the same region, the region of Thessaly, uh, where my department of uh, the University of Thessaly is established. I'm professor on, in uh, horticulture, and uh, we will speak for uh, an innovation uh, uh, greenhouse project. Uh, we can move to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, this project. Uh, is coming from uh, another project, an, another European project, Life Plus, uh, with the name Adapt to Change, uh, up to 2.6, uh, uh, almost a million euros, and uh, six months duration. This is the capitalization uh, from the results of uh, the previous uh, Life project, and uh, has to deal with the uh, minimizing of the water and energy energy demand and uh, the transfer of this uh, uh, knowledge to the farmers. Uh, okay, let's uh, move uh, to see the challenges. Uh, you know that uh, agricultural production and especially the greenhouse uh, agricultural production is uh, the most uh, resource intensive uh, concerning the soil, the energy, the water, uh, and uh, other sectors. And uh, at the same time, there are, uh, is very critical for the prosperity of the meta uh, countries. Uh, the conventional greenhouses, which are widely applicable in the Mediterranean area, the, area that, uh, the areas that are uh, uh, surrounding from uh, the Mediterranean uh, sea, uh, usually they are uh, uh, consumed uh, fossil fuels in order to provide uh, heating and uh, or cooling and uh, to maintain uh, the temperatures uh, necessary to grow plants during the winter or during the, the summer. So uh, we, we try and I think that we achieve the switch from uh, the conventional to more efficient use in terms of uh, water, energy, and other uh, resources uh, that is a priority in agriculture. So well, let's uh, move to the next uh, slide, please. Hello. OK. Uh, six countries and uh, eight uh, partners from uh, if you can uh, see to the next uh, slide, uh, to the map of the Europe, of the Europe uh, partner, leader partner was uh, my university in Greece. Uh, 
uh, other partner countries were uh, Cyprus, Albania, Italy, France, and Spain. As I told you, six uh, countries. Uh, let's move to the next uh, slide, please. And uh, the project object objective to improve eco innovation uh, capacities of public and private uh, actors uh, in the sector of uh, greenhouse agricultural productions uh, through stronger uh, transnational cooperation, knowledge transfer between universities, uh, research institutes, uh, private uh, and uh, business sectors, and public authorities. What we achieved to develop and to promote the integrated policy recommendation in local and uh, regional planning in order to boost eco-innovating uh, investments and uh, transnational level. And we also, the main, at the same time, we established an agricultural innovative uh, cluster in the Mediterranean areas, uh, creating uh, at the same time synergies and cooperation mechanisms between uh, the actors of uh, quadruple uh, helix. And uh, if we move to the next uh, slide, please, here, here are the, our, the project's main outputs, outputs uh, reads. Uh, tool uh, instruments, uh, network clusters, strategic documents, and uh, public events. Uh, we create uh, uh, two tools, two strategic uh, documents, and uh, one uh, cluster established in the same time a lot of uh, e learning uh, and e learning platform, uh, including training courses, uh, webinars and uh, of course a memo memorandum of uh, agreement uh, to the next uh, slide we can uh, start describing the innovative uh, main uh, greenhouses that, uh, that uh, based on to the need of uh, for sustainable agriculture and uh, this uh, led us to develop and uh, implement uh, an innovation geothermal hydroponic greenhouse, minimizing water and energy consumption, contributing also to circular economy and uh, green growth. Uh, the prototype greenhouses are constructed, uh, as I told you, in the region of Thessaly, uh, central Greece in the city of uh, Larissa, and at the same time, Two, say, uh, this, uh, two more greenhouses in Cyprus to have a comparison between the results of the two experimental uh, places. So let's uh, move to the next slide, please. Here is a, a, a day view of the greenhouses from uh, Larissa and from the interior uh, view. And uh, usually the results, if we move to the next slide, uh, I'm giving you in the very beginning the results of uh, the production that, that we achieved. Usually we are giving the results in the, in the very end, but uh, uh, I'm giving you in advance uh, the results because we are very proud of uh, this that we achieved. And uh, we increased uh, almost uh, two to three times the production by using environmental uh, th techniques. The production at the same time was 600 tons of tomato per hectare and per year, when the same time in uh, uh, conventional uh, uh, greenhouses or glass houses is uh, varied between uh, 150 to 250 tons per hectare and per year. Every year we are uh, produ producing this uh, quantity and we are selling to the local market and with exceptional uh, quality of the product. 
let's see now the description of the uh, greenhouses to the next. Okay, there are uh, uh, all the modern uh, subsystems uh, like uh, natural cooling and ventilation, dynamic cooling, heating system with uh, geothermal uh, heat pumps, uh, curtains, uh, CO2 enrichment system, air drying system, hydroponic system, closed hydroponic system with the most efficient uh, computer uh, for uh, the control of uh, all these uh, uh, systems, uh, telecommand, telecontrol, everything uh, with uh, new technologies. And of course, central system control. This is the central system control system. Let's move to the next slide. This is the view from the natural cooling uh, and ventilation system with uh, top windows. Uh, is an additional uh, system. And uh, let's move uh, faster to the next uh, heating system. As I told you, we're using geothermal heat uh, pumps not uh, just uh, heat pumps, but geothermal by exploitating. We can uh, see it to the next uh, uh, slide about uh, the you geothermal. Need to speed up a little bit, I'm afraid. Sorry? Please speed up. OK. Uh, OK. Uh, we're using this energy for cooling, heating, and uh, conversion of water. So let's move to the next uh, slide, please. This is a typical geothermal uh, uh, scheme. Uh, it's not necessary to extend more. Here is a view from uh, the geothermal uh, uh, pumps and the heating system, uh, uh, ground heating system. OK, let's move to the next. Uh, what we achieved uh, for the water efficiency, 45% uh, uh, less uh, consumption of water. If we, uh, we use, uh, if we compare it with the open field, this increased to 70%. And if we are use the precipitation water, the rain water that uh, we are uh, gathering, we are collecting, so uh, then the uh, water efficiency is up to 100%. Uh, About the environmental uh, benefits, less uh, CO2 production, uh, approximately 50%, uh, less use of fertilizers, 30%, and uh, comparison with the open field uh, uh, growing, 60% uh, less. Let's move to the next, please. And uh, the conclusions are that uh, you can read the conclusion, but I'm going to give uh, uh, a description different. Uh, we can use such kind of, uh, of uh, geothermal uh, greenhouses uh, to the arid and the dry areas like uh, our uh, islands like the islands of the Mediterranean, like the uh, south uh, part of uh, Europe. Uh, and uh, we can use such kind of uh, greenhouses, autonomous, with, uh, combined with uh, wind generators, combined with uh, photovoltaic and uh, sun collectors. And uh, we can start uh, growing with only with one tank of water an initial tank of water. And uh, for uh, heating uh, purposes, we can use the sea, the, la uh, the lakes, or uh, the rivers, having free energy of this. And uh, finally, to the next uh, slide, please. We can, again, uh, thank you for, uh, your, uh, uh, for your time to follow my presentation. That's all.
Thank you, Alex. Uh, your concluding words actually quite well responded to a question from the audience about uh, uh, how to address the rural transition in uh, specifically in arid areas. Uh, I think the example of the greenhouses and the potential to hugely reduce the energy use and the water use especially is uh, quite striking. So thank you for sharing this example uh, um, with us. Okay, thank you. Of course, this is just a glimpse on everything that should be done in agriculture, but I mean, greenhouse gases represent um, one of the most resource intensive ways of agriculture, so uh, we were happy that we could pick specifically this example. Now let's move on uh, to an entirely different uh, uh, topic, which is mobility, but um, Manfred, our next speaker, uh, uh, will explain us a little bit. And uh, honestly, Manfred, there have been so many questions and so many requests about uh, rural mobility solutions. I'm sure the uh, expectations are high and uh, I pass you the floor straight away. Thank you, Katharina. I'm trying to share. I think you should see my presentation. Yes. Yes, so let's move to the to the important topic when it comes to the decarbonization. So the the field of mobility is a very important uh, topic. Uh, I'm from the regional management in East Tirol in Austria. I'm the project manager for the field of mobility. Uh, we are a small a small region with about 2,000 square kilometers and a population of about 49,000. And we have 33 municipalities in our region. Just to get you a, a view how it is to work to the topic mobility for a whole region. So that's the challenge to work with all of the 33 municipalities. Um, we have, so we have. Okay, Bastard. Manfred, I think turn off your uh, video uh, to give a more bandwidth for your voice, please. Thank you. Um, I think I start, I start with the public transport system. So we have a really good transport system in almost every valley and also side valley, every hour a bus. And we have a train line which connects the region from the south to the west and is also going across the border to Italy. So that seems already good, but we have the, the challenge for the last mile. And I think in rural areas, we all tackle with this challenge to close the last mile. We need door to door services. And that will be uh, the big challenge. So what, what do we do? We are in several interact projects. So one is the, today you heard from the last mile project and we are also in this mech and in some others and I want to give you an overview what we did what we implemented what's our approach and what's the success maybe for rural areas uh, to get the last mile gap closed so actually or we have uh, different last mile solutions one are DRT lines so we have two routes you can see it on the left side with the small yellow buses they are uh, DRT lines with flexible stops and you have to call them, let's say an hour before, and then they have flexible routing and flexible stops. Then we have 14 e-car sharing stations available in our, let's say, really small region. So that's a big success for our region to have these 14 stations. And we have ski buses, hot taxis, bath buses, and so on. So on-demand lines. But the really big success are the eight municipality taxis. So they use the car sharing car. That's, that's my, favorite, my favorite project because it's challenging to install e-car e sharing in rural areas because you need a critical mass to be successful also for the provider. And we have eight municipalities. They, are, they book the car sharing car on three days a week and provides, let's call it a municipality taxi with volunteers as driver. So you can imagine what big benefit this is for the people in the municipality. They have a door-to-door -door service for one in euro for one trip. So it's a really cheap offer. 
and the municipality pays for it. Um, we also have a cable car. So for the last mile to get the children down to the school bus, we have very uh, a spread uh, area. So we have some houses, they are far away from the bus station and we work with bike and bike rent and bike sharing. And we have hitchhiking benches. So it's a, a really low cost uh, implementation, let's say, because you just need two benches, one, one at the beginning, one at the end, and you can connect uh, houses. They are far away from the center of the municipality. Municipality, but um, we, or the constant question exists: How do we get from A to B? But we heard we have already several solutions, but people do not know them, and that's why I'm today switch a little bit to the to the aspect of information and how to provide information of last mile. So it's a very diverse topic, mobility, and to work on it. Uh, and that was our last project, a mobility plan platform so to provide a holistic uh, mobility information but combined with a really good communication and marketing also nudging campaign uh, to get people known of the the last mile solution so we implemented a, a mobility platform um, you can see the link there and can try after there you can find every mobility offer of the region and you can find the topics, how to get around in East Tyrol, how to get to East Tyrol, and the important thing, activities without your own car. You have to show people how it's possible to do uh, walkings or have your free time without your own car. But we also focus, or I'm also focused on young people in my work because they are the users uh, of tomorrow. So uh, I do painting competitions and school afterwards, we printed the pictures on postcards. The postcards are for free in the whole region and they have the, the mobility website on the back. So it's also a, a promotion from for the mobility platform. Uh, I started a mobility influencer. He created nine blog stories, uh, all without the own car. So really experiences, uh, the best experiences in, in East Tyrol without the own car. We trained uh, tourism staff and municipal staff. So to get them know of all the offers and to give uh, good information to the guests and for sure also for the residents. So also we, we also trained municipal staff. So it's uh, it's a really big topic. And I think we have the time we, we created an explainer video and there you can see how it's possible to do things without the own car and what's what's important in the communication and what's a take home message. So enjoy the video, but I have to I think I have to stop the presentation first and also to share my sound. I forgot we tried it several times. So now it should work. And you should hear the sound. Die Familie Wagner plant heuer ihren Urlaub in Osttirol. Sie reisen mit dem Zug an und möchten viele Ausflüge in der Natur machen. Doch geht das ohne Auto überhaupt? In Osttirol ist das kein Problem. Mit Bus, Bahn, Carsharing, Fahrrad und zu Fuß kann man hier die schönsten Orte erkunden. Außerdem gibt es saisonabhängige Wander- und Skibusse, Hüttentaxis und Bergbahnen. So reist man entspannt, nachhaltig, sicher und meist günstiger und schneller. Am ersten Tag fahren die Wagners mit dem Bus nach St. Jakob im Defferegental. Mit der Gästekarte können alle Urlauber den Bus kostenlos nutzen. In St. Jakob bringt die Bergbahn die Familie zur Ausflugsarena Ochsenlacke auf 2300 Metern Höhe. Auf der Moseralm vergeht die Zeit für mir und ihren Papa wie im Flug. Mama Wagner träumt inzwischen von einem Kletterabenteuer, das sie für den nächsten Tag plant. Sie nimmt früh morgens den Wanderbus zur Dolomitenhütte. Dort wechselt sie auf ein E-Bike und fährt über den Almweg zur Einstiegstelle der Kletterroute. Durch den Radweg hat sich der Zustieg verkürzt. 
So bleibt ihr mehr Zeit, das Klettern in den Lienzer Dolomiten mit dem Bergführer so richtig zu genießen. Am nächsten Tag stehen die Wagners früh auf und leihen sich ein IK. Sie fahren damit auf die Kaiserglockner Straße. Oben angekommen, wandern sie über den wendelin Weingartnerweg bis zum Fiegerhorn. Dort genießen sie einen wundervollen Sonnenaufgang. Wie du siehst, für die besten Erlebnisse in Osttirol brauchst du kein eigenes Auto. Und für die An- und Abreise auch nicht. Plane auch du dein autofreies Abenteuer unter mobilität.osttirol.com. So, thank you. Um, you cannot see my video, but I'm smiling. So this video, <laughs> every puts a smile on my face. Uh, uh, it's a really nice nice project and you see family, you see children, you see the experience and that are the messages you have to, to uh, give the people. So when we are asking today, where will your next holiday uh, be? I hope you will come to East Tirol. Um, but so next slide. So my message today, yeah, written written many messages but we also work you can read but i will uh, say you some other a few words we also worked for uh, the legal frameworks and that are also topics uh, when you are implementing flexible transport systems you have to challenge or to deal with also with barriers so also um work with municipalities and policy makers so to get them implemented and the legal basis for such transport systems that's not always easy like you may know that the municipality taxes with volunteers as drivers but what we need are carers so we need people they take that topic and work on that topic and never lose the focus on it so as I'm today speaking for this topic with a smile, uh, we need more and in every region we need such uh, carers and we need role models like mayors from the municipalities. They book the car sharing car, they are driving it for their uh, everyday business or they are driving with bicycles to the, to the uh, work. So use role models and focus on young people because everything thing we do now we do for the young peoples and for the future and took them in your stakeholder uh, network and work never forget them so i think that was my last slide thank you thank you very much uh, manfred uh, unshare then you can put the video back um, we have a question uh, what is the motivation for the volunteers to drive a municipality taxi three days a week um, yeah, I want to start my video, but I think you block me. <laughs> um, no, no problem. Uh, the motivation, the motivation is that they are integrated in the municipality. So most they are, uh, they are out of work. They are elder people. So 60 and above, and they get let's call it a work back. They are integrated in the, in the municipality. They have contact to other peoples and they have an e-car. They may drive it for once a week. So it's a social benefit and it's also a social project in the municipality in, let's call in COVID-19, we saw how fast it goes and you do not know your neighbor, you have no contact and with such project, you get people together and that's the benefit. And yeah, they do it for free for, let's say it for one, one coffee per, per day. Nice, great. Um, we have seen how uh, the combination of uh, demand responsive transport, e-car sharing, the municipal taxis with the volunteers, e-bike rental and hitch ride benches uh, um, make a whole uh, array of uh, rural mobility uh, options uh, you've done a lot i think you've achieved a lot uh, a beautiful example there's a question in the chat uh, uh, asking for guidance material maybe you can attend to that and um, it is time for me to call our all our speakers uh, to switch on your cameras again uh, it's time for a little uh, roundtable discussion uh, with all of you
And um, since our audience uh, is mainly made up uh, of uh, local and regional policymakers, um, I would like to know what is the role of regional and local policymakers in promoting and accelerating the rural green transition in the areas that we have talked about, energy mobility and agriculture. And uh, I invite you to take the floor according to uh, appearance. So uh, Linda goes first. Sorry that it broke the last, I think, 30 seconds. So I could not hear the last part. Um, I, I just say you answer in the order of uh, of speak. And the, the question was, what's the role of ro local and regional policymakers in promoting the rural green transition? What can they do to uh, kick it off, accelerate it? Thanks. Um, well, I, I will try to be synthetic, but they can really play a key role in the sense of mainstreaming and upscaling. Uh, the sense is that, of course, there are many um, pilots going on at the European level. Uh, there are many frameworks, there are many indications and strategies. But once um, either a municipality or a regional authority decide that they want to, to buy that approach, they can really promote through incentive the, uh, the replication of the pilots, first of all. And on the other side, they can make sure that their policies are going towards the same, um, the same goal. So they can be policies from the environmental department, because most of the times we have different departments, right? So environmental department, transportation infrastructures department, economics, and so on. So bringing together the departments and try to understand which solution can address more than an issue at the same time that I think can really, I mean, we don't need, or maybe the dedicated green transition policies are not the answer. We need to integrate this in everything. And there is where I think governance can make a difference. Thanks. Thank you. Manolis, to foster uh, uh, the setup uh, of more renewable energy communities in the rural areas, what can policymakers do? Well, uh, I would say that the local or regional policymakers, at least in centralized states like in Greece, they don't really have a very strong policy making power. The major decisions, I think, are taken in the, by the central government. Uh, however, there are still important things they can do. One thing, for example, is they can be uh, themselves adopters of uh, renewable energy technology. I find it very, let's say, weird that, uh, but it's what usually happens, that we go to rural municipalities and we have to make an active case about uh, using renewable energy heating, for example, in their own buildings. Uh, they, they are the ones that uh, should be promoting that. But it really comes down also to, I think, uh, lack of uh, time, lack of uh, dedicated capacity, and those issues that you mentioned in the beginning. Um, of uh, let's say this event. Uh, apart from that, uh, in the energy community model, uh, their involvement, I think, directly as a member, is also very relevant, uh, and it also helps to open some doors. I think uh, so. That those are, the, I think, the two main uh, issues I would uh, argue for. Thank you, Alex. How about uh, uh, the role of policymakers uh, to foster innovative uh, ways of agriculture that are more resource efficient? As I told you before, I'm uh, coming from the region of Thessaly, uh, one of the most uh, vulnerable uh, regions in uh, the Mediterranean area and uh, in Greece, uh, together with the Greek uh, islands. So, uh, Besides the uh, environmental uh, uh, greenhouses that uh, we, we are trying to establish, uh, we, we try also to combine the circular economy and the uh, environmental uh, changes with our uh, crops. And uh, the main, the main uh, effort is to adapt the crops to more uh, friendly crops with less uh, water uh, uh, consumption, such, uh, uh, 
such a kind of crops like uh, for arid areas and uh, with uh, less water necessities. Uh, maybe uh, tree, tree growing or uh, perennial or annual uh, plants uh, adapting to the Mediterranean area. This is, yeah. Okay, I didn't think about changing the crop. I thought about changing the method of yeah. agriculture, but you see, we have, not, we not have my, to, yeah. We have to change uh, the crops and to adapt to more uh, resistant to arid areas uh, crops. Yeah, but we can also change uh, uh, the way that uh, we grow them, like uh, using less uh, water, like in your example, or by uh, drip irrigation or things like that, I think. Oh. Uh, <laughs> this is a, a real temptation with drip irrigation. Uh, we okay, I'm not going the into more it. water from the sources and uh, we expand uh, the fields uh, with uh, crops. Uh, uh, but uh, of course, we're using drip irrigation and uh, other uh, techniques for uh, less water consumption. It's, uh, it's true. It's the rebound effect. When we save something, we think that we can afford to do more. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Manfred, um, role of local and regional policymakers to foster rural mobility. Yeah, they have a very important role. So as I said at the end, they, they are our role models. So they are involved in our projects from the very beginning. And we need them also for the co-financing for such projects. and all projects are working to, to influence policy instruments and therefore they need to adopt our approaches, learnings and our inputs to the policy instruments. So, um, but yeah, for every topic, they are role models. So they have to change the, their systems first. That's my, my thinking and to show us um, what's possible. And in the field of mobility, it's it's visible. So when they're changing their mobility behavior, every yeah municipality or also region can see it, and yeah, that's a big benefit they can bring. What is the role of cooperation amongst uh, neighboring municipalities there? I mean, should they undertake the journey on their own or should they at the outset uh, seek uh, the involvement of the surrounding municipalities to make uh, to take care of functional areas and not just, uh, I mean. Um, yeah, so we also don't think just in our region, so we think of the border and we have to to think in bigger systems so to get synergies and to 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 get one solution because we, we are always saying we need one app to book a trip from a to b but that's also that ends on the country border most then you need another app and that's not the solution for the future and therefore we also need for sure policy makers and to get the system from bottom up We have a question from um, our audience. Um, Marian von Herwein and from Espon would like to know if um, there is any um, need for data or evidence uh, to support uh, local and regional policy making uh, in the areas. So uh, maybe you can cover that uh, from, from your perspective. I mean, um, Manfred. We can we can start at the at the end now. Uh, you can go first. Are there any any data or is there any uh, evidence that is needed uh, to start out uh, rural uh, mobility options? And is there anything that is lacking that uh, should be provided by some public project? That are data, yeah. We we are missing data, so it's very important to to have a monitoring and evaluation system, so not to implement. Uh, let's call one pilot, one solution, and that's it for the next two years. 
I think you have to adopt it and to fine tune it after, but therefore you need data and the monitoring and evaluation system, but also to start or to begin your work uh, to the topic mobility, you need a status quo. You need to know why people want to get from A to B and what's their, uh, what's their uh, preferred uh, model split or how they want to do it in future and to integrate them. So data are the, the most important thing, I think, in every field. Okay. Um, how about uh, in, in agriculture? Do you need any, any is there any specific data sets uh, that are necessary to start? Uh, about agriculture data, we are trying to, and we are using now more uh, precision agriculture to our uh, crops. That means uh, with, uh, with precision agriculture, with this data that we have from the crops and from the fields and from the environment, we're using less uh, fertilizers and uh, less uh, uh, water and less uh, pesticides for the treatment of the plants. So the data uh, are uh, very significant. That the, very useful for uh, our crops and the, our policy uh, uh, for the crops. I mean, for the mm. and it's necessary, of course, to establish uh, worldwide the precision agriculture. Mm -hmm. All right, Manolis, what kind of data are needed uh, to start the renewable energy communities? What kind of data you need to start a renewable energy community? <laughs> it really depends on what you aim to achieve by the renewable energy community, I would imagine. It's a little different. In, in our case, for example, uh, we have been needing quite a lot of information about uh, fuel consumption, for example, in uh, municipal buildings, now that we are looking to expand a sex activity into the heat provision. and. Uh, Sometimes you can find them, for example, through the action plans from the Covenant of Mayors, but still not every municipality has uh, been a signatory or uh, how it's called adhere to the, the Covenant, so not, they're not everywhere uh, easily available. I, it's a good starting point, especially for bioenergy projects, for example, uh, because um, usually you have to target the higher uh, heat consumers in an area uh, to install such solutions. Uh, otherwise, it's not very cost effective, I would say. Uh, but again, it, it depends on uh, what you want to do. If uh, you want to install, I guess, a PV system, uh, then you probably need some kind of uh, information about uh, land where you can use it or rooftops that are available for the installation. And yeah, generally, the more energy consumption data you have, the better. Now, if you want to mobilize resources, it always helps to have an idea of what kind of biomass types you can mobilize in the area, um, how many, uh, what, what quantities you can use, and also something that's really relevant, but many people overlook what is the organizational structure behind the biomass uh, supply. It's uh, very different and often very difficult to have to work in conditions in Southeastern Europe or in Italy, I guess, uh, where the size of the agricultural holdings, for example, are quite small. And then uh, you have to deal with uh, multiple uh, providers rather than uh, a single entity that can cover all your demands in one go, for example. Yes, yes. Good remarks. Uh, uh, Linda, on the data? Well, on the data is quite, admit, quite a challenge. We've been discussing, I mean, there is a lot of effort that needs to be done in terms of bridging uh, what is there and what can be done. Uh, data are relevant. Um, we are also against the two complex models, let's say. Uh, but I think that we start having quite, I mean, good models working with 
small amounts of data. And of course, I think it's better starting with a simple model and then improving, then stopping there because you don't have the perfect data for mm. huge models. That's, um, I mean, um, I would, so I would recommend at least to try and build partnership with the academia that is usually there right to support. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I think uh, they also the, uh, the fact that two of our speakers are coming from academia, well, three actually, uh, also shows uh, the importance uh, of, uh, of the knowledge base uh, behind uh, uh, backing up uh, the rural uh, policies. Yeah. Okay, so uh, before we come to our uh, concluding round of statements, uh, the speakers can already think about their concluding remarks. We're having a, a, a poll to the audience. And um, so, well, we have, of course, not extensively covered uh, the topic of uh, rural transition. And uh, the question to you is, uh, uh, have you heard enough on the topic or uh, would you be maybe interested uh, in one of uh, the policy learning platforms, uh, individual services on request? So I'm explaining, uh, there is a two hour uh, matchmaking possibility. A matchmaking is um, like a two hour online discussion with a selected group of uh, uh, experts about your regional policy challenge. You can request a matchmaking on any uh, topic. We will find two or three experts uh, to address it and to discuss with you your challenge. We moderate this uh, process. So you can tick, I'm interested in a two hour matchmaking. Please contact me. And uh, a peer review is uh, uh, the same spirit, but it's uh, the big brother. It's, uh, it's a, not a two hour, but it's a two day, uh, very intensive meetings uh, with four to five uh, experts from different European countries, which uh, uh, come and speak about your regional challenge. So if you're interested in that, just uh, tick the box. And by ticking the box, we are able to match your poll entry with your email and we will get back to you. So this is an option uh, from our side. And uh, I hope uh, that we have uh, raised some interest. I'm sure that we haven't covered uh, all the questions that you had on the topic. Right, so now let's come to our round of uh, uh, discussions and um, wrap up uh, statements from each speaker. And this time we start again uh, at the beginning. What is your takeaway for regional and local policymakers from the event, Linda? Um, well, I think that in this sense, the, um, the European programs and projects are very useful because I admit that by working within uh, these kind of frameworks, we are learning a lot and we also have the, the chance to um, implement things on the ground, try with pilots, and when then people are, when you try and people are convinced, you also try, you start um, drafting right policies around it, right? Uh, because sometimes we're just too afraid or we don't know enough before jumping. So I think that this could be, um, I mean, uh, it's a small contribution what I'm maybe what I'm saying, but I think that that is a very good, I mean, keeping collaborating in those senses, I think is the, the way forward. Thank you. Thanks. Manolis. Yeah, uh, I will uh, limit myself to the bioenergy aspects of the real transition and I will say that uh, I realize that it may be a bit of a daunting thing for uh, rural, let's say, stakeholders to embark on such a project, but uh, there are several success examples in Europe. And uh, if you know your resources uh, in the area, your biomass resources, and you want to know more or less what you want to do, a little uh, Google engineering can take you to some very interesting places, very nice reports uh, and other information so that you can be inspired from that one. Uh, apart from that, I would like to second what Linda was saying about uh, the importance of EU projects. We have found in many ways that uh, EU funding um, is uh, an enabler in many ways. We saw that, for example, in the case of ESSEC, where the, the B Coop project is now, uh, we think, let's say, motivation for the energy community to go one step uh, forward. But also, it's not only the horizon 
projects, but also all kinds of EU funding can be used um, to have a new investment, to set up a new project, some demonstrations or whatever else may be needed. Thank you. Yes, it brings you the resources and the collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps also the um, you can uh, make use of some, uh, let's say, specialists, uh, even if they're not from your area, but you can take them to and hire them for a while, let's say. Yes, indeed, indeed. Alex, what are your takeaways? In the era of uh, climate uh, change and uh, of the greenhouse uh, phenomenon, I think that most of the uh, environmental uh, and the research projects of European Union, such as uh, Life Plus Project, uh, Indirect Med, and uh, Horizon, of course, are in a good uh, direction. They have to keep uh, funding uh, such kind of uh, research and uh, uh, communication projects and uh, to deal more with the environment. This is my opinion. And I think that uh, generally in uh, Europe, we, we are in a good uh, way. Thank you very much. And Manfred. Let's try it with video. Um, yeah, we heard from Anolis, they are enabler. And yes, for sure, for example, for COVID-19, things like such projects and they they should support regions and municipalities in, in such projects and be a role model and don't forget to i think we need many different and also small solutions in the field of mobility and last mile in rural areas and make and think about a, a multi-partner business model make municipalities to mobility providers make institutions to mobility providers we do it with our car sharing systems we have partners they are the provider so think about they have a need and who has a need and who have a potential to finance such uh, small solutions for the last mile mm. yeah thank you very much uh, for this uh, wrap-up round um, I mean, it was a very clear call for uh, engagement in European uh, exchange uh, uh, through projects. And I think uh, it is also uh, a call for regional and po local policymakers uh, uh, to, to start working with their own communities uh, to communicate uh, about uh, these topics, to acknowledge these topics are important. And uh, uh, this is the first step to be able to harness uh, uh, the local imagination and the local uh, volunteering uh, and, and entrepreneurial spirit as well. I mean, we have seen the uh, uh, the taxis driven by volunteers. Well, this is something that uh, you can get without uh, a European uh, 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 collaborative uh, uh, project. We have seen uh, the the citizen cooperative. Okay, the kickoff uh, to set it up uh, was helped with European money, but ultimately it's uh, local people that have decided uh, to join forces. So um, I think uh, uh, beyond looking to uh, the European funding pots, uh, it is also important uh, to look at uh, and, and inspire and invite the local population to participate, yeah. to harness uh, the, 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 the resources from the citizens and uh, well, these are my concluding words. You will have a little uh, pop-up uh, uh, questionnaire um, when we close. So please leave us uh, your feedback that goes to the audience. So it is uh, my time to give a, a warm and a big thank you to uh, our speakers. Um, thank you for having contributed uh, to this uh, a little bit uh, difficult concept, uh, one webinar on rural areas and uh, different areas uh, contributing. I think uh, uh, it was very interesting and uh, you have enriched our afternoon and I hope our audience has uh, something good to take back. That's all from me and uh, have a good afternoon. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye.